Well, I mean, now that it's round two, I should probably have a better, more concise answer. <laughs> um, but my name is Alejandra Martinez, um, born and raised in the city of Bell in Southeast LA. And then what I do, we're just saying that I don't, like it changes every year. It's been changing every year for the past couple of years since I started you know, higher education. Um, so I guess now, what do I do? I guess I do a lot of art now, but mm. I just, I'm also combining my research interests and my background in like economics and urban planning with my artistic background. You know, I grew up going to my dad's studio um, since I was a little kid. So art has always been a really big part of my life. So I'm at like this point where I'm combining both and I don't really know what that outcome will look like. Um, but I guess I'm a, yeah, well, future urban planner and artist maybe. Right no, I know. Yeah, because it kind of feels like it's kind of these things that are all kind of making more sense now. At mm -hmm. least that's what it sounds like from you. There you, you go, explaining. a convergence. It's a yeah. convergence for but sure. But what do you feel like even through all those positions, what do you think has been consistent through all of them? Is it like your motive or mm, what you I, care about? I think definitely like the motive has stayed the same and really trying to figure out what tools are going to be what helps me to like achieve those goals. So even when I was like a teenager, I was like, I want to do something that helps my community. Like being born in, in Bell, I'm not sure if y'all know about like the scandal in 2010, like the corruption that was happening, like that put put my city like on my own radar in terms of what cities do for its community and that, you know, you're vulnerable to corruption, to mistreatment of, you know, folks that live there. And so all I knew is that I want to find a way to make sure that doesn't happen again and that like people in my community have more autonomy over like their future. And so at first I was like economics, like it seemed like that could answer my question. And then I moved away from that. So then it seemed like economic development, community development could help me achieve that. Um, and then I realized like when you combine art and culture with these questions, you realize like it's a really good way to come to together as a community, like through art and it really creates and can jumpstart a lot of important conversations. So I was like, mm. I want to tap into that because like art really creates conversations and helps people like come together around issues as well. Um, so then that's how it was evolving. But the mission is always the same, like increasing my community's autonomy somehow. I don't I don't know how yet necessarily, but I think that's been the guiding question, whether I'm working at a consulting firm or a nonprofit or doing anything like that's always definitely like the mission that's awesome uh, i think sometimes we also think of the answer but i think you also mentioned right now like the question is just as important um i do want to ask you just because you briefly mentioned it right now as well is that you you grew up in your dad's studio yeah so your dad is an artist yeah um and i i want to ask you how have your parents's kind of like lives influence or kind of you know affected the way that you approach this this um this way that that you're going about like tackling these issues i guess mm -hmm. i mean that's a really good question because i think it's something that would resonate with a lot of people in our communities it's like feeling like art can't put food on the table you know like my dad did have a studio in downey for many years and then like the recession hit and it just wasn't a reliable gig anymore and it became a conversation of like okay i need to find something more stable because i need to raise my kids you know um, make sure that we have enough. And so um, so I kind of grew up feeling like that wasn't a viable option for me. And like maybe that's why I really leaned into my academics because I, I do like school. Um, and I was like, I mean, I like art, but I don't know if I can, you know, make that a thing for me. So like I went ham with school. Um, but then you realize like you're, if you're always going to be an artist, whether or not you're practicing it, if there's like years where you're not doing anything, it's always it informs how you view the world, how you choose to represent it. And so like I got more comfortable like tapping into that. Um, but even then, like I just, I, I wouldn't, I'm still scared. Like if it were to be like a full-time artist, I'd be very scared because I still, it still doesn't feel possible. Um, and that's very scary reality for a lot of people, I think. And so, I mean, I appreciate that my parents encouraged my direction either way. Like they never said, don't do this, don't do that. It's just like me choosing like, oh, from lived experience, I probably won't. Mm, right on, right on. Did, you mentioned as well that one of the first ways that you saw as like, a, as like a way to support and help the community was through this vision that you had of economics, right? Um, I want to ask you what, what informed that vision or what do you think made you want to see that as the first kind of thing, you know? 
Mm, that's a good question. <laughs> yes, good questions. Um, I mean, I think for me, the reason I thought economics was like the field that would help is because I think a frustration I had back then and, e and even today is like if, if people in a community have a certain opinion of how they want their community to look, um, people bring in data, they bring in like consultants that they're like, sorry, but like, that's just not realistic. Like you can't do that. Like the numbers say that we have to upzone everything and like bring in corporate chains if like we're actually gonna help your city. And so I didn't like that argument that like, that your qualitative personal experience wasn't enough for like city council members um, to accept that and make decisions based off of that. So I was like, if I come with like an economics degree or like an econ PhD, like they have to listen to me. Like I have the facts, I have the numbers. And so I thought that it was a matter of like the questions I asked. And it's like, if I can do research that like addresses my community and like the issues that we face, like they'll have to listen to what I have to say. And that, that's, that was the motivation like when I started, but it evolved for sure. Yeah, and actually I, I have a quote from you. Um, oh. what I Because <laughs> what I like to do is I, I do like to, you know, I think sometimes the best way to also know someone is through their social media, <laughs> at least as much as they'd like for us to know. Mm -hmm. um, but in June of 2020, you, you graduate. You, <laughs> uh -huh. Sorry, sorry. I'm, I'm a journalist. What can I that's say? That's good. That's good. You did your research. <laughs> but on June of 2020, you had you had graduated UCLA with a degree in economics. And in that post, you wrote like there is a danger in there is a danger in us being complicit in upholding a structure that seeks to perpetuate the status quo. Um, with that, I look forward to what lies ahead as I scrutinize and unlearn the myths our institutions told us were true. So what caused that turning point or that change for you? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's hard to pinpoint, but I think from the very beginning, I didn't really feel like I fit into the space. I mean, the majority of people like at UCLA in that department are gonna be in investment banking. They wanna maybe go to Wall Street. They wanna be in accounting. Like they're not, there are not that many people, at least that I met or that I got to know whose intention was to use economics for like something different, you know, to work for a nonprofit, to work for the local government. It was always about like, how can I make bank, you know? Um, so that, that was the vibe itself, right? It was kind of alienating and then like the coursework is um, like I didn't align and enjoy my classes until I was outside of my department because they bring in ideas about economics, but they dissect it a bit more and it relates to my lived experience, but like definitely not in the actual department. Um, but I think like one of the moments where it really like stood out to me was when I had like an urban and regional economics class and we were talking about like rent control, right? And like, oh, the reason we can't have rent control is because if you see this graph, like you see this point and then there's like a gap and blah, blah. I was like, this isn't real life. Like this is a model. Like you can't use a model um, to like justify actions in real life. Like this is a very perfect curve that does not exist in real life. It's a very idealized scenario where the numbers work smoothly. I'm like, and that, that shouldn't be what justifies what policies we need. It's like, what do the actual people need in the community, right? Like, I don't care what the graph tells you. Like, that's that's invented, um, you know, and manipulated um, in, in certain ways. And so, I mean, I was like, yo, like you just told all the people in this room that we can't have rent control and they're gonna go out into the world pushing that idea, never questioning it because you're presenting it as fact when there's so much more nuance to the conversation. So. Yeah, I'm getting frustrated right now. <laughs> <laughs> no. But yeah, that's that's that moment. That's definitely, and it sounds like you did get that knowledge and that kind of, um, I would say, kind of care. You said you mentioned you got it outside of the classroom and outside of that major. But what what was it? What do you um, credit that? You know, those kind of values or that kind of perspective. I would say that perspective that you brought into the classroom. Mm, I mean, I think for me, um, it was like the word gentrification. You know, like that that phrase was something I learned when I was a teenager and like it, it had to do with economics too but like I, I noticed that there was like urban planners like that they were talking about that word a lot and like it seemed like they were the ones going after like an answer and exploring solutions in academia right in like academic spaces and so I was like I've never heard of urban planning and now I want a minor in it so I got my minor in that and like that was a big relief like I would do my my economics classes just to get it out of the way. I'm like, I have to do this because this is my major, but I'm just gonna focus my energy 
like everything I did, all of my experience in college was urban planning stuff. Like I didn't do any economics mm. internships, none of that. Yeah, and even before that, though, because I, I because you mentioned that your intention, even going into economics, was a different intention than many of the folks that you saw in your classroom. Mm-hmm. Um, and I kind of want to know more about that. Like, where did that intention of care and and wanting to support your community come from? And in that specific type of way, you mm-hmm. know, definitely. I mean, y'all went to Cruzitas, right? Like, (laughs) recently, like, I think that's where it started, honestly. Like, that's what I wrote about um, when I was transferring um, to university. But I think Cruzitas really stood out to me. Like, it was a space I started going to when I was, like, I don't know, 15, 16. And it felt like a community, like, watering hole. Like, everyone was going there to grab a bite. And that was, like, the first time I started to meet people, you know, different ages, different, like, coming from different cities who were doing different things um, and that were like involved in the community. And it made me feel very connected. Like when you're in a community, it might just be your classmates in school. It might just be like, yeah, the friends that you make in like sports and stuff, but you might not feel connected to like the broad, oh, sorry, the broader community. Um, And so I really liked how that space fostered connection amongst people and like, sorry. (laughs) And like the power that that came with that, with that that social capital, that social connection. and so I was like, how, how can communities foster that more? Like, it's very powerful to have spaces, more autonomous spaces where community comes together and where you can like talk about ideas um, that maybe one day, you know, evolve into like action. Mm-hmm. Um, but I just like that idea, like spaces where a community can come together to just talk about things and what they want for the future of their community. Um, so I saw it just as a very interesting space um, Cause that's where I was hearing more conversation about like community change, gentrification. Um, and I was like, well, city council members aren't having this conversation, but community members are. So how can you foster more of that dialogue? Um, and yeah, I think that's where it started. That's awesome. And you mentioned these graphs and these things that come through the economic classes and, and whatnot, but something that you've done and more recently is is the Sela community maps, right? And that I think that's kind of like the kind of like what not what goes against that and kind of like really making the importance of like community stories, right? Um, so so I want to ask you, what is Sela community maps, and <laughs> and what was it motivated by the creation for that? Mm-hmm. Let's see. I mean, it's evolved into like maybe like now three things, but at its core, it's community based like spatial storytelling um so i think the focus of the project when i first started was we were in covid right it was like 2020 like everyone's at home i was like how do you foster that sense of community when you can't be in person hanging out um and you know oral histories and his like spoken word has always been a very powerful tool for bringing people together and like i would see through social media that when someone would share like an image about their community it would bring a lot of people together and just be like wow like i also really like going to that place like oh that's one of my favorite places and so i was like oh like you know storytelling through social media can just bring people together into the same space and just to celebrate like the special aspects of their communities and then as someone that likes urban planning i like making maps and i like seeing like how it ties to like very physical spaces in our area so i was like okay i'm gonna add that like it's gonna be really cool because then you can just explore and click different places in your city that mean something to someone. And so I think that was like the main thing, like just bringing people together um, over stories about our community. And then I think like an undercurrent in like my motivation to make the project is that like, I wanna highlight that there's already value here, like that community members are already very tied um, to Southeast LA. There's places in their childhood that were very special to them and that value exists right and that it doesn't it may not be like economic value but like there's a cultural value um in a sense um and so i guess like my frustration that's very trippy <laughs> like because the way it feeds into here i thought it was like in my head you know i didn't oh, really? i didn't realize no. it was like, happening out there no. um but like the undercurrent was like cities try to create value through economic development right that's their perception um, of you know how things work and I'm like no like there's there's already value here there's like there's this cultural value there's a social capital and social value that's very important and I don't need like another azalea like we d- like we don't need another one of those to create value like we should mm-hmm. focus on what's already here nurture what's already here 
nurture the creativity, n like nurture the, the entrepreneurs, like the business owners, the artists, like who's already here. Because I think a lot of folks, like city council folks, want to create value by just bringing in, bringing in investors and bringing in like a brewery and things like that. Yeah, and w you mentioned that, and I also read like you have a paper called the Green Gentrification, right? Yeah. And that's kind of like where, where you kind of also bring that into conversation about like the values that maybe these cities have of like trying to revitalize different places, but really just to bring people in and different people out, right? Mm -hmm. but, in a, but in a summary, what, what led you to write that, to write the Green Gentrification? I mean, it was a class requirement, <laughs> so like <laughs> it was an essay I had to submit for a class. Um, I think it was like, I don't know, Urban Planning 101 or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but the reason I wrote about green gentrification is because like we've seen it in New York. I think it's like the Hudson, the High Line. Um, it was like a previously, well, I think, but yeah, historically, I think, I think black community or black and brown community um, and then the, the city was like, we're going to revitalize this. It's going to be a great community asset, blah, 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 blah. Point is, you have luxury development all around the Highline now, right? And like the people who were going to be served by this project can't even afford to live there anymore. And so it made me think of like the LA River as an equivalent of something that's coming to our area. Um, we're getting Frank Gehry from Walt Disney Concert Hall, like working on this project, investing and in injecting billions of dollars. Um, but without accountability for like stabilizing the communities around it, um, you know. So what are you going to get if we get another High Line in Southeast LA, and you get this massive LA River revitalization? Like we can only imagine what's going to happen. Like investors are going to want to capitalize on riverfront properties for this very attractive new amenity, and that's going to come at the cost of the community that lives here, who doesn't doesn't have that much access to green space, and so they're going to be displaced. And so the reason. And so then in that paper, I was like, let's talk about Frogtown then, like Elysian Valley. Like it's already an example there um, because I was like, I feel like we can see what our future will look like based on what's already happening in the northern parts of the river. And, you know, that's that's what happened. Like they a lot, a lot of the properties there started to get flipped. People saw that their home values increased by like, I think, 20, 27 percent in the span of a year. So like, what does that mean for people in that community who are, are mostly Latine, who like n cannot afford their homes, cannot afford their um, rent, and like they're just getting more and more displaced? Um, so I was like, shit, like it's gonna be it's gonna be a very bad time for for Southeast LA people, and we know that. Like I feel a lot of people in the community know that, and so now it's like, how do we mitigate the impacts? Because I mean, it doesn't feel like we can stop it at this point. Mm. Okay. Okay. What makes you so then if if that's the case what what do you think brings that hope or that kind of you know mm -hmm. to keep fighting i mean um i really look up to east yard um east yard for sorry oh my god i don't know their name but east yards um but they do like environmental justice work and they've been like on the ground for i think over 20 years in southeast la and so like I see a lot of people in the area who like, commit a lot of time to working with them to pass policy. Um, like we've had, like not we will they they've helped in like supporting um, rent stabilization in the city of Maywood, in Bell Gardens, um, and things of that sort. So I'm like they're doing the work. They have a lot of organizing experience, and like you see new generations becoming a part of that every single year. And so I'm like th there's definitely hope because there's capacity. Um, and there are people very passionate and committed to it. And so I look up to them because they've, we, we're already seeing the consequences of their work. Like rent stabilization is now going to be in effect in Maywood and people, mm. it's not the number that the community wanted, but it's still there. And if the river ever comes, when the river comes, you know, like they'll have a guarantee that rent w shouldn't be over 4%, like increases shouldn't be over 4%. Right on. Do you feel like um, the Sela community maps kind of, adds to that or builds to that um to what east yard is doing what other community members are doing mm, i don't think it's there yet you know and i and i wanted to be at that point and i think that's why like i'm excited about school and things like that to learn more tools to make it a stronger a stronger voice in that conversation but again because like because it's community based it depends on what stories people want to share and um that dictates like the stories that are being put out there um, but I mean, I, that's something I want to work on too, like strengthening relationships with the community to highlight very key issues. But I, I do recognize that I don't think it's there yet. Mm. Okay. 
And I think something that you've been doing is kind of also being there and really interacting in person, right, with different community members. You recently had like these different pop-ups last month and this month. Um, how has that experience been for you? <laughs> it's been interesting. Um, I'm very introverted, so like that's how I was like, ooh, I can run this whole thing online. I don't have to be in person. Um, how awesome. And then I got a grant like in, in 2021. And like you can't really justify using money if it's all like digital, I guess. So I was like, I mean, I guess I can bring my project to life, like make a physical map where people write down their stories. Um, but I think it's been it's been going well. Like I think I got into a groove this year and it's been a lot of fun because you never know who you're going to run into. Like and then older folks have a lot, a lot to <laughs> share and like, you know, their whole life story and it's been really great because it's more intergenerational, I'd say. Like when you're, like social media, it's like a certain window of of people, mostly on the younger side and mostly like English speaking in terms of the stories that we're putting on the map. So there you get like little kids, like um, I was interviewing little kids too and they were really cute. Like one of them, I was like, oh, like what city are you from? And they're like, I'm from the United States. And I was like, <laughs> oh, okay, let me try this again. Uh, what city are you from? And like. I'm from California. I was like, okay, okay. So like, it's been interesting learning to work um, with different folks and finding ways to like capture their story. But overall, it's been very heartwarming because how often mm. do you have an excuse to just make random conversation with someone who's like not in like, I don't know, in a community space with you, like just some random person in the park. Yeah, no, that's so true. That's so true. Um, I did want to ask as well, um, what what do you feel like you've grown or where community maps has taken you personally on a personal level mm. let's see i mean oof. it mm, wow okay <laughs> <laughs> i'm like lagging in in real no, time no no take your time um but i think it's taken me it's connected me with a lot of different people like i'll say that like at the beginning, it's always like friends, right? And people that you know that are supporting like the project that you're doing. Um, but now that it's reaching a point where it's people that I may never actually get the chance to meet in person, like some submissions are anonymous, but like just really seeing how expansive like the like it is in terms of who I'm reaching and like the people that are interacting with it. Like I've built a lot of relationships like with people, even the people that help with the civic bulletin two of them are people I had never met and I still haven't met them. We're meeting in person at Crucitas next Sunday. Oh, right on. And, but they've been willing and down to like do the work for a couple months now. So it's just, it's helped me build new relationships um, that I otherwise wouldn't have been able to create in the first place. Mm. I mean, we're, we're in this, I mean, we're here, we're we're here because that. of that. <laughs> so, so like that. But uh, you also, cause you also mentioned something on like being very introverted, right? And then that, that also placing you in a way putting you out there you know whether you like it or not i don't know or not <laughs> but um but is that also something that you've gained to learn how to navigate things and like being a little bit more extroverted is that put you in that position as well where i'd say definitely um like like when people follow the page and like they show up in person i'm like oh like i want to make sure that this is like a good impression a good relationship that we get to build so you have to put your best face forward in terms of how how you're interacting and i did some pop-ups like two years ago right so this time i'm more trained um but yeah i've definitely had to put like an extrovert face on um <laughs> And there's like a bit of anxiety like the first time because mm. so you're like, how do you keep the conversation going? Yeah. Um, but it's really pushed me in that way and I'm thankful for that because like it's made it easier like to connect with people that are interested in, in connecting with me. Mm -hmm. Like it makes me more willing to say yes, right? So like yeah. in this case, right, like you reached out and I, a previous version of me would have been like, no, I'm gonna be on camera, mm. I'm gonna be talking to someone that I don't <laughs> know, I'm like, no. Um, and so it's made it easier to say yes, yeah. and by consequence, it brings new relationships, new opportunities. That's awesome. You you mentioned that you had done something similar two years ago, and I don't know if this is th that that situation, but I saw that you had also collaborated with, with the Metro LA, and, and your brother was also a part of that project, right? Yeah. How was that experience, doing that collaboration and like, you know, I don't know if it's still the is the if that's still the situation now where you you're collaborating with your brother in that mm. in that um in and and community maps. Yeah. Um. So in that case, um, I mean that grant was useful because it gave us the money to buy the tent, right? Buy the canopy that we need, buy all the materials that we need to bring it to life. And even two years later, that's the same canopy from like that. Mm. So it gave us like the money to invest in like the very physical tools that you need to make these pop ups happen. 
Um, and so that, it was definitely interesting getting that grant. Um, I honestly wasn't like too involved in like the process. Like that's where my brother came in. Like he helped me oh, a lot with like yeah. submitting the paperwork, the W nines, like taking the meetings because I was <laughs> I was busy with other stuff. And so um, there wasn't too much of a chance to like I don't know talk with people mm-hmm. from Metro because um, so it was just like it was mostly focusing on like the actual pop ups like day uh, of yeah. like that took a lot of energy. Yeah. Um, but was it was that, interesting. Sorry, was that the origins of the pop-ups? Yeah, because oh, okay. they gave us some money <laughs> right on. to make it happen. And I just so happened to get another grant from another org um, to help fund these pop-ups. Um, so it's been helpful. Like it, it can be expensive. You're also driving around. You have to grab mm-hmm. a bite to eat after. Um, so it helped like motivate me to do it because that was a big barrier. Like mm. I otherwise, I mean, to drop over $100 on a canopy, like that, that's a lot of money. <laughs> They're expensive for sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, do you still collaborate with your brother in any type of level or is it kind of more mm. a project that you've learned to collaborate with others? I don't know. How has it involved in that kind of way? Yeah. I mean, it's always been pretty like independent and in that I like anything you see on the social media page, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm the one running it, the illustrations, I'm the one drawing it. And in that case for the grant, he just had a lot more experience like in the arts field and like my resume was pretty blank. So I'm like, I can't, I'm not sure if like I'd be, would have been qualified enough to run it like without his experience. So having his background helped and and then being like, okay, we can trust that you know how to use this money. Um, Because I had never gotten a grant before Mm -hmm. and things of that sort. And I I hadn't, at that point there was nothing art related on my resume, you know, Mm. so that helped. Um, But it's still pretty independent. But I owe so much to the people in the Civic Bulletin, which focuses on like highlighting news, like city council agenda items that, you know, you often just they fly under the radar. Mm -hmm. Um, And that group has been very helpful. Like they're the ones reading the agendas, skimming, not skimming, like, you know, diving into them and seeing like what's important, what should people know? And I appreciate that, you know, they're working nine to five. They're, They're super busy, but every month they have the chance to like, you know, do their material and... I mean, I guess a shout out to my partner, uh, Alberto, too. Like, he's he's there at the pop-ups with me. That, um, and he's working those six hours that it takes, you know, to make it happen every every weekend. Um, so I, without his help, without I, someone to help me load the car, unload the car, carry the agua, put it here, go to the grocery store, get the ice, like, doing it on my own would have been rough. Yeah, no, that's sure. real. That's real. It definitely always takes a team. Um, so I'm happy to hear that. I'm happy to hear that, that you are able to also... Cur- you know, connect with people and bring people together with that. Um, why was it important for you to include that, the civil bulletin? Mm-hmm. Mm, I mean, n- now the project does, I feel like it does a lot, right? There's like the civil yeah. bulletin, the resource map too. But for the bulletin, um, I think it started with a friend, um, Danny. They they had expressed interest like in like a newsletter, right? Because like, especially coming from a city that had a corruption scandal, like, you want to know like what are your city council members up to and not everyone has capacity to go to a city council meeting especially if like a lot of the agenda items aren't really relevant like you're not going to sit through two or three hours of conversation if there's like one thing that you want to talk about like that that that's asking a lot from the community and so we're like so we wanted to keep tabs on like what was happening and that became like a very clear way to do that like let's just look through the agenda see what's happening and then try to break it down for people in a way that they can understand it Um, so that was the goal. Like there's a lot of like lingo jargon that you're not going (laughs) to understand. And I'm like, dude, like half of us two, one of them has a master's degree. One of the persons that's helping us, um, another person's like straight up an urban planner. Um, I'm also like trained in economics and I'm like, I'm having a hard time understanding this. Like I can't even grasp this. I'm like, so how's anyone else, you know, understanding that. And so that was the motivation because of capacity, it's like we're, we're, we're covering a bit less, um, but that was the motivation just to keep tabs on what's happening. And like, it's still part of our history. It's part of Southeast mm-hmm. LA history. It's part of the story, right, of our community. It's just a little bit more, I don't know, like government stuff. Yeah, know? yeah. Well, you mentioned that it's been evolving and you're adding and things are being added little by little to, to the project. Um, through that evolution, what has made you most happy about it? about Mm, it all let's see i think what's made me most happy is that like that it's brought people together i think like it's been um really cool to see just i don't know like different people from like different generations too like sharing their stories but i think 
I, I'm happy that it's reached a point where it's a little bit self-sustaining and that people are always willing to help. Like, for example, sometimes I'll, like now that we have a bigger audience, if someone needs help in some way, like it's nice to know that I can ask the question on the Instagram and that someone can help. Like one time someone's like, you know, what can I do about like housing? And so I asked the question and then people are like, bam, 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 bam. And I'm like, cool, like this is like an unintended consequence of the project that you can like ask people for help and they're down because like, you know, they're, they're willing to give their time and energy to something, to a project that resonates with them. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, now you're also at this transition where you, you mentioned right when I was reaching out, you were mentioning how like scheduling, making sure it's working because you're also planning to, to move away. Right. Um, and this is for educational purposes for school, right? Yeah. Um, so I'm also I'm also wondering how will that affect the way that um, that community maps evolves and the way that it that it's going in the direction it's going. Definitely, I mean that's been something I've been kind of worried about too, and like that's why I get, I was really eager about doing the summer pop ups because like let me collect like as many stories as possible before I can't do that in person. Um, so that has been an aspect that I've been concerned about. But I think something that's unique about the project is that because it's so digital, like at its core, the way it started, it was a digital map. Um, like a lot of it can be done remotely, which is pretty convenient. Like we have the resource map too, that maps resources in Southeast LA. And some of that is for me driving around and seeing a sign, taking a picture. But a lot of it's just like exploring what's already out there um, through different websites, different pages. And so like it, it makes me feel very at ease like to know that I can do that. Um, and I think like something else that helps is that the story gathering can also be online. So at its core, it really helped me out that when I started the project, it was very digital, like it was all mm -hmm. online based. And so like now it's paying off because I can be super far away and like there's still a way to gather stories and I can still draw even if you know, I'm living very far away. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome that you... I. I was gonna ask you that. Like, did you do you do all the drawings? But but you're saying it. Yeah, you do. You do everything. All the art and behind it. So that's amazing. I've seen some of the videos, and it's really cool. Also, the animations you oh, do with some you. of them. Um, I also really enjoy the story you ha of your mom and going <laughs> to the library on Sundays. Yeah. Um, that is that the first time you heard it when she shared it there, or was it? Uh, or you've heard that story also growing up? I had never heard it. Like she had kind of asked me, like, "Hey, where were you today?" And I was like, "Oh, it's the Huntington Park oh. Library." And she's like, "Oh my <laughs> god!" And like, and she literally like told me that, and I was like, "Mom, hold up, hold up. Let me, can can I record you? Let me get my phone and just say it again, exactly the same way you said it, like the exact same emphasis on the wow, you know." Um, so it was very in the moment. Um, um, that's the interesting part. I'm like, I want to interview her more because you never know what she has to has to say. Yeah. What? What? I mean, I, I also want to ask, like, what does your family think of, of this project? And has it has it built a different relationship with them? Is it you know, what is it? What has it affected it in any type of way? But what do they think of you doing this project? Mm -hmm. that's, I mean, I think with my immediate family, well, we're the only ones like in like Southeast L.A., if like you're not counting Downey, <laughs> so like, uh, so Downey folks don't really like n like know about the project that much. But I think my family, it's been kind of cute seeing how how supportive they are, and uh, like they came to one of my pop ups in February. I made cafe de olla and conchas, and then my oldest brother who's like, you know, like he does his own thing. He's busy, right? <laughs> He's like, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna show up. My mom came too, and like, they're just like sitting down and like enjoying their cafe de olla. And then like in my last pop-up, my brothers came for that one too. So like, it's it's been cool. They're like, we don't have anything to do. We're just gonna go over to your pop-up and like <laughs> enjoy the agua fresca that you made, you know? Yeah. Um. So it's been, it's been really cute in that way that they're just willing to show up. And sometimes like I don't even know that they're coming. They just, they just show, show up. That's show cute. up. That's awesome. Um, so I kind of want to go back to this this shift that's happening as well because you mentioned you were in economics. You 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 graduated in economics, but now you're going into urban planning, and it sounds like that's going to be the um, the course you're taking, right? For for education. Mm -hmm. um, for you, why? What is it that about um, specifically map making and urban planning that you got attracted to? Mm. That's a good question. I mean, I think as an artist, like it was a very natural 
No, not progression, because I feel like that moment came like very out of nowhere. I didn't expect to make that connection, but I think like visually, I was very drawn to the way that stories and data was expressed through maps. And you could really tell like, when you have a shitty map versus a good map, you're like, <laughs> what am I looking at? What does this mean? And I was very intrigued by by that, like using maps as a way to tell a story, right? And so, um, like at first, that's why I came with a lot of like my economics background, like I was mapping data, I made a map or two, I think like pollution and like, uh, rent prices in Southeast LA. And I really like that. It's just a very straightforward way to share important information that doesn't require like having a PhD, you know? Cause I encountered, when you're reading like academic articles, the lingo is already like challenging, but then the data, the graphics, like it can be very hard to interpret. And I was like, maps are very straightforward. Like they just tell you what it is, but that's why they're also powerful. Cause it depends on like, you know, what questions you ask and what you represent. Cause you can, map something that's not that accurate. And I think a lot of people can, mm. you know, relate to that. Um, and so that was one aspect, just artistic background. Like I like making pretty maps that tell cool things. Mm. Um, so yeah, I think that, that was that was that. And then the Southeast LA map, I just think it's kind of fun to like have a self t self navigated tour in Southeast mm. LA digitally, you know? And as a tool, I just, I thought that was really fun. And I don't know how to, code or do any of the computer <laughs> things and i was like i can do that <laughs> like at the yeah. minimum i can do that amazing i have a few questions left um my second and last question is what do you envision for uh, Sela community maps in the future mm -hmm. i mean i really want to have the capacity to do more interviewing like i i do like collecting stories online but like i want to like i don't know multiply it by 10 you know like have the capacity to go out do like street interviews with random people of all ages and get their story, do more long form interviews as well to get like a deep dive into people's background and history. Um, like there's an Instagram page called This Side of Hoover and they're documenting gentrification um, in that area. And like she goes about, I think her name's Sammy, and like she goes about finding people who have been in the community for a long time and like getting their story. And like, and I want to do that too. Like there's there's older folks whose stories we might not get the chance to capture and I want to make sure that that's like on the archive. So yeah, I want to reach a point where I'm like interviewing everyone and <laughs> getting like, I don't know, a hundred stories, you know. What about for yourself personally? What do you envision for yourself? Mm, I mean, right now, like the, the long-term dream is like a PhD, but that's like super far away. Like I'm like, girl, get your master's first and then, and then we'll see. Um, but I think I'm drawn to that um, as much as like my department wasn't like the best. Like I, I did find a home in, in the urban planning field. And I think the reason I want that is because you're pretty autonomous. Like I, I don't know the politics of being in academia, like what that's like, but you're autonomous in terms of the research questions you want to ask. And like you get to choose what you want to look into. And I'm like, okay, I can get paid to like figure out things that help my community. So I think that like, that's the overarching mission. Like I don't want to work at a place that makes me work in other cities and places that I have no connection to because mm. I'm invested in finding a way to support Southeast LA. And as of now, like it only feels like I can do that like through, through academia as someone that likes that's research awesome. and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. No, amazing. Um, I think one last, the last question I have is, um, is a question that, that you pose to, to those you interview, but uh, what, what is your favorite memory, um, <laughs> in Southeast LA? Mm, let's see. I'm going to have to think about that one, but I mean, it all goes back to Crucita. <laughs> I'm like their number one fan at this point, but I think my favorite memory is like being broke and going there and then like my, my brother used to work there too and so like they're like oh you're his broke little sister <laughs> like <laughs> we're gonna give you a discount so you can come and enjoy the space and it was just a lot of fun because at that point like I left high school early and I, I didn't I also didn't have a car and like your friends are in school so you can't be hanging out with them so I was like I don't know what to do I don't know where to go <laughs> to like have a good time and I just go to Cruzitas I take the bus and I'd be parked there for like hours like reading books and doing journaling and that was just a very special place for me. And that was a very special period of my life. Just like, it was kind of like a sabbatical period. I wasn't really doing anything. And I was yeah. just being artsy, fartsy like there and just having a really <laughs> good time. And I felt very independent um, 
so I'd say that was one of my favorite memories. So you you graduated high school early or you left high school early like throughout the day? Um, well, I fully I left my junior year, so oh, okay. like I was in like continuation school, which means they give you a homework packet and then you like do it at home and uh-huh. then you bring it. Okay. Um, so like I was like one of the few like sixteen year olds like with like I was what? like shit like, <laughs> I'm not in the school I don't know what to do with my yeah. time. So yeah, I wasn't like I wasn't stepping into a classroom for oh, like okay. a, for a couple of months. Was it because you were ahead of everyone, or what? What was the reasoning behind that? Um, I'd say it's like a combination of like I mean, high school's rough. Like, yeah. like academically, like I was talking uh, with my partner yesterday and some family. I'm like, yeah, like high school doesn't have to be as hard as it is. Like, <laughs> I'm waking true. up at six thirty in the morning, yeah. coming home like after the sun is set, doing homework and like rinse and repeat for like four years, and so. Like it, I definitely reached burnout, like there, like, mm. and so I was like, I can't thrive in this environment. Um, it just so helped though that my brothers had gone to community college, and that hadn't been something that I had considered before. I didn't know what going to community college could look like. I'm like, okay, like, what happens once? Mm. Like, do you stay at Elac? Like, mm-hmm. what what happens after? And I realized that you could like transfer to university. So I was like, you know what? I'm done with the. 6 30 a.m to like i don't know that cycle um oh, wow and so the only way to do that was if you left high school and but i didn't know that you could test out until like a couple of months later oh wow and i did that's did awesome. that yeah. and you also mentioned that you were reading books during that time were there any pivotal books that you read that you're like wow this is i guess maybe not even like politically or socially but just like that you really enjoy to read mm, man i wish i wish i could share i wish i could tell you that i knew but uh-huh. i guess a fun fact about me is that i have a hard time remembering what i read <laughs> like i have so many books that i've like read as a kid that i'm like i know i loved it like it left a really good impression on me but like it just it went one one ear and out the other um and i can't tell you the plot and i and there's <laughs> and yeah, it's it's pretty bad um, but I mean, I didn't read this one then, but the open veins of Latin America, mm. that one is definitely a very powerful book, um, that talks about like the impacts of colonization, you know, in, in Brazil and afterwards. And it just, it makes you look at your own community and be like, how do we see, like, how do we see the impacts of colonization in our area now, even though it happened mm-hmm. centuries ago? Like what are the relationships and structures that still exist? But I was not a teenager when I was reading that. <laughs> No, but the, but books definitely play a major role into what what it is that and how we view um, the world around us. Mm-hmm. Um, but thank you so much. Thank you for so much for coming through. I really enjoyed this conversation. Um, and yeah, is there anything you'd like for us to know before we end the episode of anything coming up, anything important for Let's us to keep see. in mind? Mm, if you're from Southeast LA, share your story, please. <laughs> Cause I won't be able to find you from 3000 miles away. So like <laughs> submit, I don't know, call the hotline, leave a voicemail, tell your story. Um, it'll help me out and I'll help you out too. That's, that's my yeah. announcement to the world. <laughs> awesome. Well, you, you said you're leaving th- how many miles? Three, I don't know how many, but you're going to MIT, right? How are you feeling? How are you, are you, how are you feeling about it? I honestly have not like packed or anything. Like I, I just quit my job like a week ago. Okay. So like it's, I'm still like, you know, figuring things out. Um, but yeah, like I haven't packed a thing and I've lived in California, right? My whole life. So I'm just like, yo, like what do people wear over there? Like, is it cold? How cold? I don't know. Um, so I'm feeling excited, like leaving the nest, um, but with the ultimate goal of like coming back for sure. So since I see myself staying in LA for like the rest of my life, it's like the one shot I have to, to figure out, you know, what it's like to live somewhere else. That's okay. awesome. Well, I'm happy to hear that that you'll be coming back. Yeah. All definitely. Right. Thank, Thank you. you.